So, any questions on the homework? Oh, the homework. I, I, so, I uploaded the homework today for assignment three. So, that's due on October second. But only first three questions will be part of the midterm because that's something we are uh, learning today, learning now. Uh, but the last two questions will not be part of the midterm. Yes. So after today, we can finish the first three questions. Sorry? <coughs> after today, we can finish the first three questions. You should. Okay. Yeah. Because that's part of the exam. So. And I have office hours right after this class. So if you have any questions, to come to me during the office hours. Okay. Uh, let's get started. So. We were talking about second order systems. The transfer function is g of s equals to All right. And what have we done so far? We have talked about rise time, percent overshoot, peak time as well as settling time. Uh, we have, we have uh, learned what the impulse response of a uh, second order system is for various values of zeta. Uh, we have learned about the step response of the second order system for various values of zeta. The important thing we noted was if zeta is less than one, there are oscillations. If zeta is strictly greater than one, or uh, sorry, is equal to one or greater than equal to one, then we have an exponentially, uh, we have an exponential term and uh, there is no oscillation whatsoever in the impulse response or the step response. Today, uh, we are going to talk about, and then we saw some examples of second order systems and solved some very simple numerical examples for uh, designing controller as well as um, designing components of second order system. Uh, today's topic is about what happens when we have a third order system uh, or when we have a zero in the second order system? Um, so let's, uh, let me start with the pole zero diagram of the second order system. So this is my real part. This is my complex part. When zeta is equal to zero, where are the poles of the system? Imaginary lines, right? So I have I, j omega n and then minus j omega n. So when zeta is in 0 and 1, then the poles have, uh, poles are complex numbers and this is where the poles of the system would look like. Uh, this magnitude is omega n square. Uh, this is minus zeta omega n. And the this part is square root 1 minus zeta square omega n. Okay, so the real part of the pole is minus zeta omega n, and the complex part is one minus the magnitude of the complex part is one minus zeta <coughs> square with the square root multiplied by omega n, and this particular length is omega n square. When I increase zeta to be equal to one.
where are the poles of this system when zeta is equal to 1? On the real line. So you have a double pole at minus omega n. Okay, so this is the way to show double pole. You show two x's uh, side by side. That's a double pole. Zeta greater than one, then you will have two poles. Yes. Are the poles always on the negative side? The poles are always on the negative side. Yeah. Let's check for zeta greater than 1. The poles are minus 2 zeta omega n plus square root zeta omega n square minus omega n square. So I have minus zeta plus minus square root zeta square minus 1 into omega n. These are the two poles and they are always negative, okay, if zeta is greater than 1. Okay. So what do we notice? A step response of this system involves undamped oscillations. A step response of this system is a damped oscillation with the, uh, the amplitude decaying by a factor of e raised to minus zeta omega n t. Okay, so that's this part. Uh, in the case of zeta equals to 1, the exponential part decays according to e raised to minus omega n t, and in this case, they uh, exponential term will decay according to the uh, location of these two poles just like in the other cases. Okay. So whenever your poles have imaginary part you will see oscillations. When your poles are real there will be no oscillations in the step response or in the impulse response of the system. And we will see damping if the real uh, part of the pole is strictly negative, we will have no damping whatsoever and so the oscillations will continue with the same amplitude throughout the time if the real part of the poles have zero, so, so the real parts of the poles are equal to zero, okay, which is the case in this situation. So oscillations are sustained, oscillations decay, no oscillations whatsoever in these two situations. All right, so what's the goal for today? The first thing we are going to try is I am going to add another pole in this, well, not in this case, but I'm going to add another pole in this case, and then I'm going to see how the response of the system changes, the step response or a, uh, or a impulse response of the system is going to change once I put this pole, a new pole, in this particular system. And then, I'm going to add a zero. I mean, so we are going to add a pole, and then we'll add a zero, and we'll see how the response of the system changes once we add a zero to this particular uh, second order system. So that's the goal for today. So let's. Let's try and look at 
this problem. Effects of adding a pole. So my transfer function is 1 over gamma s plus 1 omega n square over and this is a third order system. Okay, before we move on to this particular problem, let me try and understand what the step response for this first order system looks like. So can someone tell me what the inverse Laplace transform of this transfer function is? What's the inverse Laplace transform? So let me remember, let me recall from the Laplace tables, L of e raised to minus a t is 1 over s plus a. <coughs> okay, this is something I know from Laplace table. I want one of you to compute the inverse Laplace transform of this uh, transfer function and tell me what the signal looks like. Yeah. What's the multiplier here? 1 over gamma? Yeah. Okay, so let's try and plot the response. So this is time. This is uh, y of t. Well, I shouldn't say y of t because I'm using y for this. Let me call this f of t. So f of t. Am I using f for anything else? No, I'm not. Okay, so f of t is fine. Uh, oh, this is the impulse response, right? This is not the step response. Uh, let's let's work with the impulse response. There is just one point that I want to make, and then. We'll move on to this problem. So when gamma is very, very small, uh, at time t equals to 0, <coughs> this is 1 and 1 over gamma. So when gamma is small, it starts from a very high value. This is 1 over gamma. And then it decays. It decays and goes to 0. And this is the impulse response, right? So impulse. What if gamma is very, very large? Okay, so when gamma is very, very large, it starts, so this is 1 over, let's say gamma equals to 0 0.01 and gamma equals to 100. And this system is going to behave like this. Okay, this is also decaying exponentially, but the decay is not as rapid as this one. So for large values of gamma, the signal doesn't decay rapidly. For small values of gamma, the signal decays extremely rapidly and goes to zero very quickly. Okay? The same thing will be, the same behavior will be exhibited in the step response wherein this is impulse.
this is step response this is gamma equals to 0 0.01 this is gamma equals to 100 okay very gradual they both will have a limit equals to 1 so the steady state will be equal to 1 Uh, not for the not for the uh, step response because the DC gain when s is equal to 0 is equal to 1 so the steady state is going to be equal to 1 for the step response not for the impulse impulse steady state is 0 I see blank faces No, gamma is large, it doesn't go quicker, it goes very slowly to steady state. When gamma is small, it goes to steady state very quickly. Oh, yeah, I, I think that is correct. All right. Okay. Yes, you have a question? So at that point where gamma equals 0.01, the actual value on the FT axis is going to be 1 over 0 .01. Yeah, 1 over, yes, that's right. 1 over gamma. That's this value, and this is whatever. This is uh, 100, and this is 0 0.01. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I shouldn't write minus. Okay, this is 100. Um, all right, so the idea is when gamma is small the system responds extremely fast to any input when gamma is large the system responds very sluggishly to any input okay so this is the backdrop with which we are going to analyze this particular system um, where is the pole of this so the pole is one minus one over gamma right so uh, if gamma is let me draw it here So this is minus 1 over gamma. That's where the pole is. So if gamma is small, then the pole is farther out. On the imaginary axis, when gamma is small, the pole is, when the gamma is very large, the pole is very close to the origin. OK. OK, all right. Uh, any questions so far? The only thing we need to remember is this diagram. Small gamma, fast response, large gamma, slow response. That's it. I'm going to erase this part now. So let's find the impulse response of, so I want to find the impulse response of this transfer function. This is a third order system. How would I go ahead and find the impulse response? Any thoughts? Yes. Just one. Yeah. Impulse is just one. And then what do I do? Partial fraction, right? That's our friend here. So partial fraction, so I have A over gamma s plus 1 plus B s plus C over
All right, so I need to expand the numerator now. So I have a s square plus two zeta omega and a s plus omega n square a plus b gamma s square plus b s plus c gamma s plus c equals to omega n square. That's pretty horrible. <clears throat> okay. I get this expression. Now I need to group similar terms together. So I get A plus B gamma S square plus two zeta omega and A plus B plus C gamma S plus omega n square a plus c equals to omega n square. <coughs> Sorry, are you able to see it? No. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I hope that's better. Okay. Any questions so far? Pretty routine. What is A plus B gamma? Zero. Zero. What is uh, two zeta omega and A plus B plus C gamma? Zero. Zero. And what is Question? Okay. So the first one gives me, so let me call this one, two, and three. So I have A equals to minus B gamma and C equals to omega n square one minus A. Which is equal to omega n square one plus B gamma. Okay. And what's the value of B? I'm going to write the value of B from my notes. It's minus omega n square gamma over Okay.
all right so all of you agree with this these results okay a b and c values so i found out what b is in terms of all the problem parameters and of course i can substitute it here in order to find the value of a and c but the value of a and c are not important we were talking about two different regimes when gamma is small and when gamma is large okay what happens when gamma is very very small 0.01 or something even smaller what is the value of b zero. well close to 0 small very small because gamma is very small what's the value of a close to 0 because gamma is small and b is small what's the value of c roughly omega n square right uh, because this term is 0 all right so let me write down the observations gamma is small implies a is 0 b is 0 c is omega n square okay when gamma is large of course this uh, approximation doesn't hold because all these terms are going to have a significant value associated with it so a b and c are not going to be insignificant numbers okay so all of you understand this part right let's go back to this laplace transform so this has been so i can now do the partial fraction of this when gamma is small and what do i get <coughs> what's the inverse laplace transform of this whole thing let me call this capital y of s a over gamma e raised to minus t over gamma plus b over omega n square and then uh, f prime t plus c over omega n square f of t uh and i'm going to define uh yeah i'll take a question in a bit f of t is inverse laplace transform of omega n square over s square plus Yes there was a question No one okay Okay uh we wanted to study the effect of adding a pole we did the partial fraction we figured out the values of a b and c when gamma is small we noted that a small b small c is equal to omega n square i took the inverse laplace transform of this signal and i get this inverse laplace transform what happens when a and b are small so if a is small this term is close to 0 when b is small this term is close to 0 and the only thing that remains is this particular term right and it c is roughly equal to omega n square so when gamma is small the inverse laplace transform of y of s is roughly equal to f of t okay is this clear i'm going to pause here for some questions yes where did you get 
you get the first or the derivative of f of t? This one? Yeah. So this is bs multi bs over this big term, right? So I'm going to divide it by omega n square and multiply the numerator by omega n square, right? And then I have s term, which means so s multiplication of s in Laplace domain is derivative in time domain, right? So I'm just using that uh, idea here. We've used it a couple of times in the class before. So I'm just going to use it without explicitly mentioning it. <coughs> okay. Is it? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, so you are right. There should be a negative sign here. Let me double check it. I think you are correct, but let me double check it from the Laplace table. Page 59. No, uh, no, it's derivative is S. Okay, sorry, there is no negative sign, it's positive sign. Okay. Okay, so S, Fs is equal to F prime T. There is no negative sign. All right, so what we are seeing here is if gamma is small, the second, the, the uh, impulse response is not very different. You do the same thing for step response, the step response is not going to be very different and so on, which means that if gamma is small, I can just remove this term and approximate my system as a second order system, not a third order system, okay? Because the response don't change uh, if gamma is very, very small. Yes? I guess this is kind of intuitive, but could you just know that from just plugging in a small gamma and getting one over one, and then you have the rest of it as a second It is. It is obvious after you have had some experience, but not obvious when the first time you see it, okay? So this is the first time when you see it, so it's not obvious, but uh, when you do the math, it turns out to be an obvious fact. All right. So empirically, after you do several simulations, people find that if one over gamma is greater than 10, zeta omega n. So what is gamma being small? Well, one over gamma being larger than uh, some number. So when one over gamma is greater than 10 zeta omega n, then approximation is valid. Actually, I didn't write what the approximation is, so let me write it. Okay, so impulse response of GS is the same as impulse response of the second order function. Step response of GS is the same as step response of the second order transfer function. In the case of small gamma, when gamma is, what, is, what do you mean by small? Well, one over gamma should be greater than, should be greater than 10 zeta omega n. That's the meaning of small gamma.
let's draw the pole zero diagram of this second order, uh, of this third order system. So I have two poles here. This is my minus zeta <coughs> omega n. And this is my 1 over gamma. That's the new pole that I have added. Okay, And the new pole is 10 times farther than this distance. OK? Any questions at this point of time? So, yeah. Uh, it's at least 10 times farther, or is that it is exactly 10 times farther? Well, it has to be anything greater than 10. So 10, 11, 12, 15, 100, all of that is fine. OK? If it is closer, then this approximation is not valid, and so you have to design the controller for the bigger system, like the full third order system. Um, so that's the idea. Adding a pole is not a problem as long as this coefficient of s is a small number. All right, yes? So if you have a third order system, then you just find all the poles, and then that's right. the one with the smallest not the one with the smallest, okay? So if you have, as soon as you have a pair of poles with imaginary part, there will always be oscillations, right? So now if you look at the ones on the real line, the one that is farthest away, so very, very negative, you can just ignore those poles completely and keep the poles that are closer to origin. But the, so it doesn't really have an impact on the system? Uh, yeah. So let's, let's try and figure out why it doesn't have, a, have an impact on the system. The reason why it doesn't have an impact is because, as we had mentioned, for small values of gamma, it responds very quickly. So the transient phase is very, very small of the order of a few milliseconds or a few seconds, and you kind of just ignore that particular transient response okay, from the overall response of the system because it just it quickly uh, gives you exactly what the input was without any delay. Well, there is a small delay, but not a huge delay. Yes? Is it a rule of thumb that like, poles that are closer to the origin have more predominance? Yes. The yes, that's, that's exactly how you call it in the controls literature. So these are known as dominant poles, and the ones are not so dominant poles, so you kind of ignore them. OK. So these are dominant poles, and this is a non-dominant pole. And you can ignore the risk, that, that pole completely from the system. OK. All right, so we have studied the effect of a pole. Now let's study the effect of a 0, where we don't have to go through this uh, long derivation. So if there are any further questions, I'll take them now. Otherwise, I'm going to erase the board. Yes? Does it have any impact if gamma is large? So if gamma is large, Then this is your pole, right? When gamma is large, it's closer to the origin. And so this will have a perceptible, res perceptible effect on the response of the third order system. And so you cannot really ignore it. You have to use it in your control design technique. You can't just remove it from the transfer function completely. Any other question? All right, so let's add a 0 to this transfer function.
Okay. What is the impulse response of this system? This is the of S omega n square. Let's we put one over a outside. What's the inverse Laplace transform of this one? Right here. So that's F prime T plus F T. Yes? Yeah. G of S, right? The inverse Laplace transform of G of S? Well, this is the transfer function. So the Laplace transform will be for impulse. 1 g of s y of s. I, I just want to keep the response and the transfer function distinct, even though they have the same expression. All right, so when I added a 0 at negative a, I look at the inverse Laplace transform, I get this, uh, this result. Let me plot the pole zero diagram. So I wish there was a way to copy and paste it elsewhere. OK. That was a simple copy paste operation. Uh, so I have these poles. And I added a 0 at negative a. What happens when a is close to 0? What happens when a is close to 0? So remember, f of t involves oscillations, right? It involves damped oscillations. So f of t. f of t looks something like this. OK. What does f prime of t look like? f prime of t is also going to have oscillations, right? Uh, so this is sine wave. It look like a cos wave, so it will perhaps have This is my f of t. This is my f prime of t. OK? So when a is small, the derivative will be a prominent part of the inverse Laplace transform, which means that the derivative will be a prominent part of y of t. OK? On the other hand, if A is very, very large, then this term is going to be small, and this term will be the dominant part of Y of t. Okay? So which means that if A is large, Y of t is roughly equal to F of t, and so 0 can be ignored. 0 can be ignored. However, if A is small, then 0 cannot be ignored.
all right is this clear so the effect of zero can be ignored when a is large which means that the zero is far away from minus zeta omega n then i can ignore the zero completely if minus a is close to minus zeta omega n then in that case i cannot really ignore the effect of zero and so that's going to affect the response of the system and so we'll have to use the entire transfer function to do the control system design is there a definition for what a small a means uh, let me check no the book doesn't give you any uh, specific value but uh, but they do have a table where they show for different values of a over zeta omega n how does the percent overshoot and things like that change so you can look at the figure and then you can figure out what the percent overshoot is and so on so i'm drawing this figure from the book so when a over zeta omega n is is equal to uh 5 the response looks like something like this this is the step response and this is time and this is a over zeta omega n equals to 5 and this is a over zeta omega n equals to 0.5 okay so you see that the percent overshoot increases significantly uh the settling time also increases uh a little bit uh the rise time increases because uh so the rise time reduces because you see the derivative of the step response as well in the output uh because a is not an insignificant number a is a is uh, close to 0 a is small and therefore the derivative term prominently features in the step response or impulse response of the system yes um so i saw wavelengths comparing those two things well don't compare the wavelength because okay. uh, it's not drawn as accurately as it's there in the book perhaps i should bring a handout for the adding of zero in the next class so you will see exactly how the response are okay. okay the only thing to note is when a is small the derivative features prominently in the response and therefore the percent overshoot and things like that changes and it has lot more it has oscillations of higher magnitude in those situations okay uh if there are no further questions uh, you're all free to go we'll meet again on wednesday otherwise i'll be happy to take any other questions you may have